Thank you for having me. I'm Melinda Morrill from North Carolina State, and I'll start out by acknowledging my co-authors, um, Bob Clark and Bob Hammond are both in the audience, um, my colleagues at North Carolina State. Our co-author that is not here, Emma Hansen, is a graduate student at North Carolina State and also a policy researcher at the retirement system. And she has really been instrumental in um, getting us and putting together the data for this project and deserves a lot of credit because she's also found data that the leaders of the retirement system tell us they didn't even know that they had. Um, so we've been really fortunate and are indebted to her. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Sloan Foundation for supporting this research. Um, I'm going to talk today about retirement planning of older workers in the public sector. And hopefully um, in a working longer conference, we don't need too much um, motivation to convince you that retirement planning is important. Um, but I do want to spend a few minutes talking about retirement planning in the public sector in particular because a lot of um, things about the public sector are a little bit different than retirement planning in the private sector. Um, the first is that, uh, as we know, um, public sector workers are typically covered by large defined benefit plans. These can be very generous. In North Carolina, with 30 years of service, you can retire with a full unreduced benefit at any age. Um, so a teacher who starts working at age 22 is eligible to retire at age 52 and so may spend a long time in retirement. Um, on the other hand, for very short career workers, these benefits can be pretty ungenerous. Uh, in fact, it requires five years to vest, so a teacher who works only for three years uh, in the North Carolina system doesn't have any pension benefit at all. Um, and so from a employer's perspective, we're not sure exactly how much people ought to be saving, um, but uh, we know that the retirement income security depends not just on how long they're working and what age that they start, but also how long they're going to spend in retirement, um, how much money they want to have in retirement, whether or not they have income from a previous employer, a spouse's income, and whether or not, particularly if we see people retiring in their 50s, uh, they plan to work after they retire. And so, um, we argue um, that good choices require knowledge and planning, um, and people have to make these choices, not just how much to save for retirement, which um, I think there's been a lot of interest in the literature, but also um, choosing the appropriate ages to separate from a career employer, uh, choosing the right age for Social Security claiming, and uh, how to annuitize wealth. This is another area where the public sector is a little different. In the private sector, um, a, large DB program uh, pension plan, you would be uh, automatically defaulted into a joint and survivor annuity. Uh, public sector workers face a larger array of choices. Um, there's no default. Uh, and so there's um, even more um, interest and concern about uh, making sure that you're insured against uh, both inflation risk and longevity risk. Um, also, uh, as I said earlier, public sector workers who are retiring at younger ages um, may be working for pay after retirement. And so in this paper, we uh, want to address which older workers are planning for retirement um, and are older workers planning for retirement and can we observe any behavioral factors um, and financial literacy that contributes to this planning. And in the end, do we see that um, planners, how we've classified them, uh, are arriving to, um, at older ages uh, nearing retirement better prepared. Um, so before I uh, preview our findings, I'll just um, take another minute to um, plug why I think public sector workers are particularly interesting. Um, in this case, we're looking at public employers in North Carolina. So it's, um, you could think of it as many small public employers or one large pension plan, two large pension plans. Um, but it's a lot of people. The public sector is 15% uh, of the workforce. So we're talking about a big portion of the population that may be distinct from um, private sector workers. Relative to the private sector, um, public workers tend to be co covered by more generous benefits and only rarely have defined contribution plans as the primary plan. And so the big focus on saving um, and automatic enrollment that we see in the literature is a little bit less important in the, pri in the public sector where uh, the DB benefits are more generous. Um, but we also see uh, earlier ages of normal retirement. There's also um, the argument, and I think um, maybe uh, still up in the air whether this is really true, but that the public sector might attract people who have different preferences towards risk and towards um, 
uh, uh, personal discount rates. So these may be people who prefer uh, consumption later to consumption now. And if this were true, then what we know about planning um, for private sector workers may not actually be appropriate for public sector workers. And so we don't want to be basing our policies on um, information that is not appropriate. Um, in the public sector, we think about um, human resource goals as an um, issue of public policy concern. Um, we hear a lot in the news about uh, the baby boomers uh, retiring and a big shortage of teachers. And so it becomes uh, an important issue when we think about whether or not the incentives embedded in the retirement benefits for public sector workers are really in line with the goals of public employers and public employees. And finally, um, the reason why I think it's really interesting to think about public sector workers is that ultimately taxpayers are responsible um, for the retirement benefits and they're pretty expensive. So we want to make sure that they're operating the way that we want. And we hear in the news about local governments um, declaring bankruptcies and um, pensions and retiree health insurance are often um, part of the issue. Um, part of what's to blame. So understanding how people retire, how people think about retiring, how people plan and make sure that they're prepared for retirement in the public sector I think is particularly important. So what we find in this study that um, we look at older workers who are nearing retirement, they're age 50 to 69, and only about half of them um, have engaged in planning the way that we measure. We um, have two different measures. Uh, we do find that planners have accumulated more wealth and are more likely to want to retire earlier. Um, and we also show um, that some measures of behavioral preferences, so those who exhibit more patience and those who have finan higher financial uh, knowledge are also more likely to be planners. Um, just to give you a bit of context, I'm going to be talking about two large um, defined benefit plans in North Carolina. Um, one covers teachers and state employees, and one covers uh, local government employees. And um, as I said earlier, it's a very large system. It covers over 800,000 um, employees with five-year vesting. And these statistics are just meant to suggest that this pension plan is, is very robust, it's very healthy, and no one is really worried about um, there being a financial crisis. So a lot of the workers in our sample are going to be covered by this very um, generous, well-funded, um, substantial pension. Um, they also have the option of participating in some um, voluntary supplemental plans. There's two state-managed plans um, and a new plan coming online this fall. Um, there are also local um, supplemental plans. And um, at least half of our sample is covered by a state retiree health insurance. Um, local governments have the option of providing health insurance. Um, really quick, there, there is a, a relatively recent um, but very small literature on planning and retirement. Um, I list two papers here um, that look um, at how people are planning and thinking about retirement and again show that planning does lead to um, higher levels of wealth accumulation and more retirement readiness. Um, also a new um, growing literature that shows that financial literacy can be very important for um, retirement income and preparedness. But in general, all of the past literature is really focused on the private sector. Um, so I think um, the real strength of this project is a data set that we've put together. And my discussant told me that I'm not allowed to call it unique, because all data sets are unique. So I'll call it a really great <laughs> data set. Um, at least I think so. Um, on active um, uh, workers in North Carolina. Uh, we have two, um, uh, we, the, the main source of data is from the retirement system records of um, teasers and elders, and this has all the things that you think about um, that an administrator would want in order to administer a pension plan, so um, date of birth and date of hire and that sort of thing. Um, and, and the second source of data um, we're pretty excited about, Orbit, is a online um, retirement benefit tool that uh, workers can log in and check and see what their benefits are going to be. They can do different scenarios. They can um, try and figure out how much money they're going to have in retirement. And the uh, retirement system put a lot of money and resources into the system and now reports that 
Um, they no longer provide benefit estimates to people over the phone, um, and they advise their HR um, staff at the public employers across the state to just refer people to Orbit. So they tell us that people who are planning for retirement are going to be getting the message, um, you need to log into Orbit. So what we have is um, information about who's logging in, how often, and what they do actually when they get to that website, and we're going to use that as one of our measures of planning. Um, the third source of um, data that we have is from the Supplemental um, Retirement Plan Participation from the state managed plans where we can see not just participation, um, but how people are contributing and when they're contributing. And finally, um, what's taken us the most work is a, a large survey of workers. Um, we surveyed 15,000 workers. We got a response from over 2,000 workers. And we have a lot of detail in the survey about how people are thinking about retirement and how they're planning for retirement and what choices they think they're going to make. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, the survey all the way at the end. So for this study, I focus on two measures of planning. Um, the first we're calling a subjective measure uh, or self-reported measure from the survey, where we ask them, have you already tried to figure out um, how much money you're going to need to have in retirement? And we classify people as planning for retirement if they said, yes, I've thought about it and I have a plan. Um, the second measure, which we call the objective measure, is um, from this Orbit website where we look at whether or not people have logged in and requested a self-service estimate, which is an estimate of what their benefit is going to be in retirement um, within the last 12 months. And this is what the Orbit website looks like. Um, I know you can't read it. I just wanted to share it's very extensive, um, but also kind of well, well designed and laid out. So someone who is planning logs into this website, fills in all the values, and, and press go. Um, so first, I'll um, show you that our measures of planning are sort of operating the way that we expect. Um, I, I said at the beginning, only about half of our sample are planning, and if we restricted it to planning in both measures, about 30% of people have um, self-reported planning and objective planning. Um, people that are higher earners and uh, more years of service are more likely to be planning. Um, and this measure is correlated with survey responses to uh, sources of information. We also ask in the survey how they're feeling about retirement, how they're thinking about retirement, do they feel ready? And those that are planning are much more likely to feel like they're doing um, the right amount of saving for retirement. Although I should say that um, only about 51% of uh, planners agree that they're saving the right amount for retirement. So, um, um, yeah. So one of the innovations in the study, um, where we borrow from the HRS uh, three hypothetical choice questions that enable us to characterize people as um, either patient or impatient, um, and one that allows us to measure whether they're more or less risk averse. Um, and then we add uh, three financial literacy questions, also adapted from the HRS. Um, one on compound interest, one on inflation, and one on tax advantage. And these are um, trying to get at whether or not people really understand how retirement savings works and what the benefits of retirement savings are. Um, so we'll put uh, the demographics and these um, behavioral preference questions into a regression model. Um, uh, I'll do, run two separate regressions, uh, one on the subjective measure of planning and one on the objective measure of planning. Um, and we put in demographics, patients, risk, and financial literacy, um, but I should have the caveat that we're just doing a reduced form analysis and the retirement benefits, which is going to be a big portion of um, these individuals' uh, retirement income, is also a function of a lot of the things in the model, um, age at higher, age at separation, salary, and so we're not really able to separately identify the influences of expected benefits and demographic characteristics, but here you go. Um, this is the, the first half of the estimate, and we see um, that individuals uh, um, who have more years of service, who have higher salaries, uh, whites, um, people who are married, people who are in their home, are also more likely to be engaging in planning. Um, then we see um, financial literacy seems to matter here. There we go. Um, for both measures of planning, whereas our patients' um, measures, uh, although they're um, both positive, are uh, only having predictive power for self-reported planning. 
Um, what we think is particularly interesting here is we, we think a lot about, or the literature in the past has really thought about risk and attitudes towards risk. And um, we think that maybe patience has a lot more to do with how you're thinking about planning. So um, what this says is individuals who are willing to wait for a future benefit are also the ones that are thinking the most and planning the most for retirement. Um, the last part of our paper looks at whether or not planning is associated with things that we um, might think about for preparedness for retirement. And I'll just uh, tell you what the results are before I show you the table here. Uh, planners are reporting younger planned retirement ages. They're more likely to be participating in supplemental plans. They're over three times more likely to have saved at least $250,000. And they're more likely to not want to work after retirement. Um, and those are just the statistics. Uh, so this work is, is still preliminary, um, but our, our findings so far suggest, um, first we are introducing um, these two measures of planning, and we show that planning is related to wealth accumulation, savings, and confidence in retirement income security. Um, people who demonstrate time, patience, and higher financial literacy are also more likely to be planning for retirement, and planners are reporting younger planned retirement ages and are more likely to not want to work. Um, so we think um, at this stage we can say that there's uh, implication for public policy in, in that um, perhaps financial literacy is going to, or financial education could re improve retirement planning and retirement income security, and that perhaps looking at supplemental savings is one measure of whether or not people are planning and thinking about retirement. But if we instead sort of broaden our approach and say, as long as we're getting people to engage and think about how much money they're going to need in retirement, that supplemental plan participation may miss the fact that some individuals, when they start to plan, realize that they are in fact saving enough um, or they're happy with their retirement savings. Uh, in this paper, uh, we're planning to incorporate a, a lot of additional variables that we've gathered. Um, i just skip uh, through this. But I just wanted to end or, or take a, a few minutes at the end to pitch our larger project. This was um, the first stage of a three-year project um, where we're thinking about the transitions for retirement. And so we wanted to start out by thinking about planning for retirement in order to convince um, you and ourselves that planning for retirement is an important outcome in and of itself um, that we'll be able to revisit in these other efforts. So I told you about the administrative records and um, a survey that we've conducted. Um, right now we're planning for an experiment that will be conducted hopefully later this month um, where we're going to be sending a flyer out to older workers that reminds them that they could be participating in supplemental savings or could be participating at a higher level. And one of the outcomes that we're going to be able to measure with this is not just whether or not that increased participation, but also whether that encouraged people to go to their Orbit website and log in and see it, make sure that they're saving enough for retirement. So um, looking forward to that. Um, we're also planning to uh, survey recent retirees to see um, what they're doing now, uh, particularly the ones that retired at very young ages. Are they working after retirement? And do they feel like they were properly, um, that they properly planned for retirement or are they working um, because they, they made a mistake? And finally, we're going to be doing a two-year follow-up of um, the older workers in our first survey to see how retirement plans are evolving over time. And um, one of the things that we're particularly interested in, in in this survey is whether individuals who are planning are, in fact, sort of more likely to be meeting their goals and um, having stable, stable plans over time. So, then. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Pencavel. Right here? Yeah. Great. You just want to leave it here for the whole time? Well, uh, <laughs> where, where, uh, where's the previous page? Is that it? Yes, it is. Well, I spoke with uh, two of the authors of this, uh, Melinda and Bob, before uh, at the break, and I know that this is a, a quick first draft of the research that uh, Melinda has um, uh, proposed. So I'm more or less guided, um, uh, my remarks are really guided towards uh, what I would like to see in the next draft. Um, there's, it, it is indeed 
a, an unusual uh, set of observations. <laughs> um, but I don't think the authors make clear what particular it, uh, it, what is their particular uh, interest. Uh, they're interested in indeed the determinants of planning, but what this e equation tells us. Uh, which one is that? It's, yeah. Well, um, uh, this is a remarkable equation with 2,200 observations. Age doesn't matter uh, in this column. Age doesn't matter. Years of service doesn't matter. Uh, gender doesn't matter. Education doesn't matter. Uh, race doesn't matter. Um, uh, you, you'll see that uh, this, that's true for a number of. Uh, oh, this is right. Excuse me. Um, and and the reason, of course, is that uh, I mean, there, I think this may be the. It's been a long time since I've seen an equation in which age doesn't matter. <laughs> now, surely age matters. And what's happening is that age is embedded in some of these other variables. It's being absorbed by um, uh, salary, perhaps, uh, marital status, um, whether they're wealth, uh, own home. Uh, so uh, the next page has uh, more yeah, more, more uh, uh, indicators, and uh, it is indeed striking um, how few variables seem to matter using conventional statistical tests. That's because um, I think that um, I'd like it when I say, I'd, I'd like to see the authors say, we're particularly interested in this relationship, we're less interested in that relationship. The way I would approach it, really, is um, I, I would be particularly interested in to what extent can we account for retirement planning with three classes of variables. Risk aversion, time preference, and financial literacy. I would start out by simply entering those variables. I mean, my guess is that one, my guess I mean, there's a lot of literature suggesting that women, for example, are much more risk averse in financial issues and indeed in others uh, than men. And um, so I suspect, but I don't know, of course, that um, the, the um, apparent irrelevance of risk aversion is due to um, uh, it being correlated with all the other things that are in the equation. Um, I would start at a first pass, at an equation in which you had simply risk aversion, time preference, and financial literacy. Then ask, with what demographic characteristics are each of these associated? And then, third step, replace um, these financial literacy, risk aversion, and uh, time preference with those demographics. Um, I think in that way, one might get, a, I think, a cleaner understanding of what these data are trying to tell us. Um, I would also add a third column. We've got two indicators of planning, self-reported, whether they use the website. These people also have an option of enrolling in a DC, Defined Contribution Plan. I would have thought that that's a prima, prima facie evidence of planning. And that uh, all these, uh, uh, the equations that I'm suggesting that be estimated uh, be augmented with another column here. Did they or did they not um, uh, enroll in a DC plan? Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, Oh, and, and, and perhaps finally, um, the, the, I mean, I mean I, I, it's, it's almost certain that some of these, that time preference and risk aversion as measured is going to be associated with these things. The, the time preference, uh, one of the, time, the benefit in, uh, measure of time preference, where they're, where they're asked to choose between a 
a steady annual stream and a uh, smaller stream coupled with a big lump sum payment, I mean, th that surely would be correlated with age. Mortality rises with age, and if you think uh, uh, your mortality rate is high enough, you want that big dollop of uh, uh, benefit. So, um, so my, my, my major, in fact, my really my important point is that I think you need to state outset, at the outset, what do you care about? Do you care about the impact of gender holding constant financial literacy, uh, patients, risk aversion, et cetera, et cetera? I don't think so. So that's the, so putting them all in an equation like this, is, is, I don't think, the better way uh, to proceed. Um, finally, I don't know whether you have this, uh, but if, you're look, if, if you proceed this way and you use these demographics, uh, there is one other demographic uh, characteristic that I would be uh, interested to see. Um, there's a paper by a former student of mine, Tom Delia. Um, who looked at um, uh, a different, uh, different measures of risk, these financial ones, he looked at injury on the job, work injuries, and the degree to which um, uh, different types of workers, different types of individuals, were, uh, had preferences uh, relating to work injuries. The group that had the greatest aversion to accidents, fatalities, um, were single parents, men and women, fathers and mothers, single parents who were concerned with um, a safe job that won't put their child at risk. Do you have child status? Whether or not these people have children? So these are all workers over age 50? So I know. We ask if they have dependents, whether they have a parent or a child. That are okay, well, I'll, I'll, on the basis of Tom's work, I'll wonder whether uh, uh, having a dependent uh, matters in terms of planning. Okay, that's my, my comments. I'm interested if you have any thoughts on causation and correlation. Uh, I would like to believe that planning does cause uh, better retirement, more prepared for retirement, and running retirement planning workshops, I'd love to have that conclusion. But what I seem to observe is that the haves tend to show up at the retirement planning workshops and the have-nots tend not to. So I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on teasing out the causation versus correlation there, because what I'd really like to see is the people who have have-nots, they're the ones who have the most to gain from good planning, but they're the ones not to sh tend not to show up. So just curious to see if you have thoughts on that. Um, yes, I totally agree. Um, in this study, we, we haven't come up with a clever way to get at that. Um, what we're hoping to do with our experiment is to introduce information um, and, and see if we can affect behavior, which enables us to have some measure of um, the effect of education. But in this context, um, we're, we're pretty limited in that way. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, there were two kinds of statements in the presentation that concerned me a little bit. The one uh, type was about um, correlation versus causation, which you've already said a word about. Most of the time you were careful about that, but for example, at the end, when you were start, starting to talk about policy implications, the statements at that point yeah. really were taking those correlations as, as being causally meaningful. And I think it's important to be careful about that. The other kinds of statements that um, uh, concern me a bit uh, were that there's a lot of normatively laden language. Uh, and this is very common in this literature. Uh, people refer to good decisions and bad decisions, and they take on faith that certain things are good and other things are bad. 
Planning is supposed to be a good thing. Financial literacy is supposed to be a good thing. Saving more is supposed to be a good thing. Uh, it's worth thinking about whether there's actually a foundation for that. If you think about planning, planning itself is an incredibly heterogeneous thing. I mean, particularly when you ask the question to some individual, did you plan? And they say, yes, I did. That could mean a ton of different things. It could mean that they sat down all by themselves to try and figure out what they need during retirement, equipped with no understanding of compound interest or risk or anything else. In which case, it is not at all obvious that they did themselves a favor by doing that. For many people, planning means that they turn to family members or friends who are equally ill-equipped to think about this. In other cases, people do go to experts and talk to them. But even in those cases, we don't know whether the expert is helping them express their own preferences more effectively or whether the expert is telling them to do something that the expert would do, which again does not necessarily mean uh, that they are um, better off. And I think that this fundamental, yes. <laughs> this fundamental question has not gotten uh, enough attention. Um, it's at the top of my mind, some of the people here heard me talk about a week ago in this room uh, about some recent research that we've done that, to try and dig in to some of these issues, and I will not take the time to talk about that again, but just want to say that a lot of these preconceptions just turn out to be wrong. Uh, that many of the things that you think improve decisions turn out not to be improving decisions when you have the right measures. Um, yes, yeah, so one thing that we were um, trying to do in this paper is to um, step away from supplement, supplemental plan participation as an end-all, be-all goal of, um, and, and instead think that um, if people are looking at what their retirement income is going to be and, and deciding that that seems to be right, that, um, that that may be a positive thing, but I agree that we have a long way to go. Um, and we tried to include, um, we had, haven't gotten a chance to, to quite process all of the data that we have in, um, some other measures of preparedness in, that we have in the survey. We do ask them about sources of information. We do ask them a lot of detail about their plan. Um, we allow them to say don't know a lot in the survey, and, and we sort of started counting that up. So um, are you planning to work after retirement? Have you thought about it? Um, one thing, a um, uh, uh, couple of tables before uh, that we found is uh, a fair number of people don't even know how much wealth they have um, accumulated or what their benefit's going to be. So I, I agree this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot more work that could be done. Should be done. Uh, yeah, I just to, to follow up on that a little bit, it sounds like you, you've gotten a start on trying to actually measure the extent to which these, these planning measures uh, impact actual outcomes you can observe. In particular, you mentioned the fact that, uh, that there's some evidence that there's more wealth accumulation. There's some also, also some evidence that there's earlier retirement. And, and I guess I was going to ask, related to the earlier retirement question, uh, you know, in Social Security, we have this idea that you know, early retirement is kind of a bad idea that there are big gains to delaying. In a lot of these public pension systems, we have the idea that early retirement actually may be, uh, that sometimes there are actually very generous buyout factors that occur. So just as that is being one example of, you know, can you relate these planning measures to actual decisions that people are making that are either, uh, you know, f uh, financially optimal or where you could say, yeah, they could have optimized some financial aspect of their of their use of this retirement system by doing something else whereby the caveat is you know there's always revealed preference so we don't know what the disutility of work is and other other things but still it'd be nice to know whether people are optimizing on financial margins if they're planning more absolutely um one of the things we're excited about having this objective measure of planning is that we can actually use the full 800,000 people data set to look at retirement ages and how that's uh, related to the uh, supplemental plan participation and, and planning, uh, the subjective measure of planning. But do we know, is it financially optimal in the North Carolina retirement system to delay or to, to, to take early retirement? Uh, early retirement, I believe, is actually equivalent. So the question is, is, what do you mean by that statement? So once you get to your 30 years, yes, you should take it because there's uh, the sort of usual sort of actuarial penalty of a DB plan where you're giving up a year of benefits to stay on working. Uh, between the time that you become eligible for early benefits, or which are reduced, the, the idea is that they're about actuarially, the reduction is about actuarially fair. 
well, on average, which of course means that they're different people get a different uh, incentive out of that. I'm, I'm, I, I don't think you covered this beginning. I'm curious, uh, you know, if, if, well, let me state differently. It seems to me there's a group of workers we don't have to worry about. It's people, people with public sector pensions, right? They're, I mean, the pensions are good and turnover is very low, right? So, but do we, do we have, a, I mean, this gets back to Doug's point a little bit. Do we know a little bit more about, you know, objective measures of how, how often these people are really, you know, f facing, let's say, a big income decline or big consumption decline? I'm sure we know that, when they retire? Because others might say, no, that, that, that a lot of the stuff shouldn't matter much, because these are people who just, these are the folks who just don't have to worry about this stuff, and they probably know that. Um, yeah, so I, I think things are sort of changing now. Um, people are living longer, and so in some sense, this is, we're worrying about the, the people to come and, and what their experiences are is, is not yet determined. But um, do we have a good statistic on? Well, so we, we've got the data that shows their earnings, up until retirement and what their pension benefit would be. So if that's your question, yes, we, we've got that down. Uh, the, the point that one of the points Melinda is making is that, you know, if, if you continue to retire at 55, even if you have a good pension to start with, with inflation, the cost of living adjustments are there, but they're not full, you can have a deterioration over there. So with increasing life expectancy, greater public, greater savings by public, employees might help them fill that gap. But then also the other qu uh, point that you need to remember is not everybody works 30 years. Some of these people are hired late and they you know, may work 15 or 20 years, the pension's substantially less. If they work five, maybe they got a pension from somewhere else. So uh, across, again, trying to, as I guess uh, John pointed out, I mean, the, these things are, are definitely related and some people with short work histories have low pensions, and if they're going to have an, a, a retirement income relative to their previous earnings, they need to be saving more in order to reach that. You might focus on this. Because they, they, they might get this too. Yeah, I mean, w one thing we, we haven't gotten up yet, but we're hoping to do is just look at the time until retirement and, and how much time there is. Um, so we certainly saw some um, years of service mattering a little bit, but we haven't really um, tried to pull that apart to understand why. Is that the size of the expected benefit, or is that just another measure of age that we're it's correlated? Uh, down, down here, yeah. I have a question about the uh, experiment that you uh, were um, describing at the end. Mm -hmm. It seemed like uh, the treatment for people was to inform them uh, to, to tell them about the supplemental benefit as well as a supplemental plan as well as maybe give them a shock that they would you know log on to this website and start planning as well um, given that you're um, you're interested in the effect of planning on the outcomes will you be able to separate that from people learning about the supplemental program itself and maybe en enrolling in that as well like Will, will these things be like kind of coupled in your in your experiment? Are we able to separate? Yeah, that's the the hope um, is to try and sort of use both of those outcomes, um, and we're gonna we're focusing on a group of um, employ public employers that only offer the state managed plan. So we're hoping that we can track who reads the email, who clicks on it, who signs up, who just looks for more information, and ultimately chooses not to sign up. We'll be able to track those separately. <clears throat> so if you just went into the website to sign up to start saving and you didn't learn more about what your expected benefit were, we would know that the reverse is also true. So. Other questions? Hi, I, I had a question about just uh, the sample selection. So I, the response rate, it's not great, right? So I was just wondering how these 2,000 people compare to either the whole sample of 800,000 or the 15,000 that you tried to field the survey to. In particular, I was surprised that the average of people who go to the Orbit site is actually 54%. I mean, that 
Yeah. I, I don't know what is going on in the background. Maybe there was a lot of email reminders that, you know, encourage people to use this tool, but um, that's a lot higher than I would expect given the low usage of sort of planning, online planning tools in general. So I was just curious about the selection of the sample. Yeah, that, it, that's another thing that we're, we, we, we have a table in our appendix that shows um, along demographic characteristics, um, our response rates look sort of reasonable and, and similar, but we got a much better response. We had uh, two forms of the survey, an email version and a print version, depending on whether or not we had an email address and our email sample was a much higher. We had about a 30% response rate. Um, and not too surprisingly, our email sample were classified much more likely to be planners. Um, so yeah, it, it's something that we're trying to understand. Unfortunately, so we have a lot of information where we can look and see um, whether our respondents uh, are similar according to the administrative records. But of course, it, what we're interested in is these behavioral factors we don't have as much. So um, one of the things that's uh, neat about this project, if I understand it correctly, is that you're doing some of your own surveys, and you're going to follow up with people after they retire. Yes. Um, do you know, did you say that, did you ask them already whether they intend to work after they retire from this job? We do, yeah. So that you can then compare that to whether they do or not. That's right. And can you then ask them for those whose actions were different from what they thought they would do? why it is they did that. I mean, I'd be curious if, curious if the finances didn't work out. Yes. Or the extent to which the finances didn't work out. Or people said, I had plenty of money, but was bored. Or uh, a lot of people leave the labor force for a while at this age and then come back. And it's, right. I'm curious to know why they say at least they did that. Yeah, that, that's one of the questions that motivated sort of our, our proposal and our research study was trying to understand. We asked them a few questions in this survey about why they're thinking about working for retirement or not. Um, un, we, so fortunately, unfortunately, we only have a two-year follow-up. So for someone to be working, to retire, and then to unretire, it's probably unlikely for that whole process to have happened within two years. But um, m maybe we'll get to follow up with them five, ten years down the road. <laughs> so, so uh, do you think you could add um, questions that would uh, to the website that would uh, try and uncover what was actually learned on it so that you could get them to put something in about an expectation before they get an answer? I I'm looking at my, my colleague who is our... <laughs> yeah, put, put something into the Orbit website that says you've posed a question. Uh, why don't you tell us before we answer it uh, something about your beliefs about what we're about to say? If, if they would let us do that, that'd be great. I, I don't know. I, we haven't asked a question like that, so we would. Uh... I mean, then, that, then you'd really get some image of what they were updating. Because it's very interesting. It's a very interesting additional data set, but it might need slight enrichment to kind of really, to, you know, bring home the bacon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great point. Okay. I think we're ready for next paper. Thank you.